that special welcome to Danita Carlson, who is here today uh, to represent Love, Inc. Well, that, uh, you, you know, just listening to you all, that's a good sound. Uh, good to hear you encouraging one another. And uh, that's part of why we gather to worship. And, and another part of why, a big part of why we gather to worship is um, to connect with the Lord, right? To draw near to him. And uh, it's not quite Thanksgiving season yet, but we have a verse up there that, uh, that reminds us of, of giving thanks to the Lord and telling of, of all his wonders. And we're going to do that with a couple of worship songs this morning. And they're old, old songs uh, by to date, my standards at least. Uh, but uh, I, I'd encourage you as, as we start to worship together, just kind of uh, let these words be your words to the Lord. Uh, they're both addressed directly to him, uh, as is the part of Psalm 23 we're looking at today. You are with me. So, uh, so let's use this as uh, a time to draw near to the Lord to address him personally and to say, Lord, you've been so good. say you've been so good to us but we realize that uh, even even when maybe we go through a difficult time God does not cease to be good right and uh, the next song we're going to sing reminds us that uh, we have everything we need in Christ who gave himself for us uh, on the cross and uh, that that even when we're when we're weak when we're struggling he is our strength so uh, Let's sing it to him. You are my all in all. Thank you. 
Please be seated. Let's, uh, let's just take a minute to pray together. Oh Lord, uh, you have been so good and your name is so worthy. And maybe as we've sung these words, we've begun to count those blessings and maybe we've begun to to be reminded of the overwhelming grace that we know in you. And we thank you. You are truly our all in all. And I pray that as, as we worship this morning, Lord, we ask that you'd immerse us in the greatness of who you are Because life isn't easy sometimes, and we may be carrying a lot of anxieties with us. And what we need to know more than anything else is that you are absolutely with us and absolutely for us. We need to be enabled to look away from our difficulties and, and our doubts and, and look to you and see your beauty and your strength. So help us to do so, and as we do, may we bring great glory to you, Father, in the name of Jesus, your Son. Amen.
us to sing a song here um, before we get into the scripture and message that uh, many of you know well. It's just a prayer inviting God to speak to us and uh, to breathe on us breath of God. Should we turn to that?
Michel I'd like to invite you to turn to Psalm 23. Well, let's turn to it together. I'm going to put it on the screen, and we're just going to say it together. <laughs> this time uh, in King James, just because some of you learned it that way, and we've been looking at it in different versions. So, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. <laughs> he restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. So we've, if, you, if you haven't been here past few weeks, we've been looking at Psalm 23, and we're up to verse 4 today. We're going to look at the first part of verse 4, actually, today. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil um, for you are with me. And I think, you know, when we come to this verse, I want to take you back again to the idea of a sheep and shepherd. How many of you have raised sheep? Any of you? Has anybody here raised sheep? Have you lived next to anybody that's raised sheep? Not much, if any. Or one? One. <laughs> Two. Okay. Um, my first real contact with sheep, um, which I always imagine them to be clean always and good smelling and woolly, right, uh, was with the sheep owned by uh, a friend named Jerry Volster near Pella, Iowa. And I remember going out on, on the Volster's farm and the first thing I heard about his sheep was the neighbor's dog got another one of them last night. There was a rogue dog of a neighbor that, that would get in through their fence and loved to, to attack their sheep. And so the first thing I learned about real sheep is they're vulnerable. They, they are also dirty sometimes, and sometimes they're smelly and all the other stuff that go with animals. But, but they're very vulnerable. They're very helpless. They really can't defend themselves, can they, very well? Uh, I suppose they can run. That's maybe about all, but a dog can run faster let alone a wolf, you know, or any of the things we imagine in biblical times, maybe being out there. I don't know exactly what predators that there were. Uh, we know wolves are, are of some kind are mentioned. And let's just stop and pray for Melissa a minute. A uh, little trouble with blood sugar, I think. So we're getting her some help here. And let's just offer a prayer. Lord, we thank you for Melissa, and we pray that in this moment, you would be her help and her strength. And we thank you that hopefully others can provide the help that she needs to get regulated here. We pray for her safety and your blessing on her in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're all vulnerable. You know, whether, whether it's a danger out there, whether, whether it's an illness, whether uh, a virus attacks us, and there are some pretty scary viruses out there in the world today, aren't there? Or, or whether uh, we're vulnerable to uh, blood sugar that isn't regulated, or, you know, what it, whatever it might be. We are described in the Bible as sheep, and, and sheep, among other things, need protection and rely on protection. I shall not lack. Remember when we began this? The Lord is my shepherd. I will lack nothing. And the rest of the psalm does what? It tells about the things that we won't lack. And so today we come to a, a really important one. I, I won't lack protection because we're vulnerable and there are dangers out there, many of them. 
And none of us knows how we'd respond if some of those dangers hit us. Have you, have you ever wondered, you know, you've seen something tragic happen to somebody else and you think, I wonder if I'd, how I could handle that. I wonder how I'd respond to that. And we really don't have much of a way of knowing until it happens to us, do we? And sometimes, sometimes we just wonder if we'd have the strength to get through. And David must have wondered some of those things too, even as he wrote this psalm, because he had things to fear. Um, and we all have things to fear. Fear is a big part of this, isn't it? This idea of going through the darkest valley. We call it the valley of the shadow of death. Do you know valley of the shadow of death is actually, uh, the shadow of, shadow of death part is actually one word. That means just kind of the deep darkness. So a poetic way of saying it is the valley of the shadow of death, but it, it doesn't have to do with just, you know, that, that we have mortality and one, one day we're going to, you know, cross that river, right? And, we're, and, and this life will be done and there's maybe some anxiety associated with that. But this is written about the, the valleys that we go through in everyday life. The word meant just the darkest gloom. Job uses it. In Job chapter 10, uh, there's, there's a reference to, to this dark gloom. It, he says, the land of gloom with thick, like thick darkness, like a deep shadow without any order, where uh, even the light is as thick darkness. Job was written before this, so maybe, maybe David even had that in mind as, as, as he says, the dark, even though I walk through the darkest valley, God, you're with me. There's, there's, he's talking about the things that strike fear within us, whatever they might be. Not just the, the fear of our own mortality, but certainly including that, right? And, and we need to hear that. Because some of us may have been sold a message that uh, if we're real followers of Jesus, we won't go through the dark valley. And yet the Bible tells us again and again that we will. That there, there are going to be times and circumstances in life that are going to be really, really troubling. And things are going to look really dark, even for those who trust in God. And David anticipates situations looming. In fact, you know, when, when, uh, when you think about it, our introduction to David, most of us, is what? Well, there's an earlier introduction, but the, the introduction we all remember is David and who? Yeah, talk about, a dark, talk about a dark chasm to go through, right? In fact, it actually, the fight happened in a valley. <laughs> and it was a dark valley for Israel because we're told that, that all the warriors had been taunted by Goliath. And he had, he had all the tough guys shaking in their boots, right? In fear, paralyzed by fear. And he comes along a little shepherd boy, and it isn't that he's not afraid, but he says, Who, who's our God? Right? So Saul tries to give him all the armor, and he says, number one, it's, it's too big and too heavy. Number two, let's just trust God. And, and he takes five stones in his sling, and he goes out into that valley and faces the fear. And, and I'm sure he was terrified, but God was with him. But the fear was real. We think, some people think, that when this psalm was writ written, which was really probably rather late in David's life, that it may have been written during the time that Absalom rebelled against him. One of his own kids tried to take the throne from him, tried to have him displaced, maybe even killed, you know, and, 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 and leads this rebellion against him. And it may be at that time, quite late in David's life, that he's reflecting back, and here he's in another dark valley. And, and he says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, and, and we know dark valleys, don't we? Valley probably isn't even the right word because I don't know what you think. I think peaceful when I think valley. I think verdant when I think valley. But, but this valley is a chasm. Maybe it's like a box canyon, you know, and, 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 and the darkness itself is scary, isn't it? You know, if you imagine a literal sheep walking through a narrow chasm, a box canyon maybe, and, and, and you know there are predators there. You know the predators are lurking. And, and if it's dark, that's far worse, right? Because you can't see the danger. <laughs> but the danger is night vision, and it's going to find you. And, and it's, it's not just the circumstances, it's the fears, right? 
And so we pass through times of real fear, you know, and, and even imagined fears. And it can shake our faith. It can shake our faith. And, and maybe the worst thing is when we face it alone, right? If we walk alone, and sometimes we do, some, and sometimes we have, even if we're not walking alone, we have the sense of walking alone. Have you had some things like that where maybe, you know, you don't know anybody that's experienced what you're experiencing. Maybe it's been a fight with an illness. Maybe it's been the loss of a soulmate. Maybe it's been uh, a prolonged period of unemployment. Maybe it's been fears for your own mental health. Maybe a long battle with depression and you wonder, you know, am I going to come through this? And the fear is real. And it happens to all of us. Sometimes, you know, our culture has kind of a hedonistic view of suffering because we have so much and, you know, so many things we can get medical care for, we can get help for. But imagine living in a place where, you know, you don't have that, where if, if you get sick, you die, you know. And, and when, when you see people suffering and, and maybe, maybe suffering from malnutrition all around you or, or you know, someone invades your land and, and commits atrocities against your people. And sometimes, you know, we get the idea that if we follow Jesus, in turn, God ought to make everything easy for us. And we even ask ourselves when we're going through life's terrible dark valleys, God, what have I done? Are you mad at me? And yet persecuted Christians all over the world go through far worse. You know, what do they say? The fears are real for us and the fears are real for them. The valleys are real and we don't know why. We don't know why we go through some of these things. I think Billy Graham said one of the, one of the best things he could have said when back, back years ago when the Oklahoma City bombing happened and how many people died? Like 800 or something and, you know, innocent victims. And Billy Graham had an opportunity to speak to that community. And a lot of people were saying, why did this happen to us? And, and he said, I don't know. We don't know. We don't have the answers. God only knows. But he said, I do know this. I do know he hasn't left you alone. And that's what David comes back to, doesn't he? Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For you are with me. In fact, with is probably the big word of this passage. In fact, I'd suggest that with is the big word in the entire 23rd Psalm. Wouldn't you say so? that we have a shepherd who is with us, who is with us even through the darkest valley, even through the worst experiences. He has promised never to leave us or forsake us. That was what gave David strength. That's, that was his strength when he faced Goliath. That was his strength when Absalom rebelled. That was his strength when Saul was hunting him down and he's hiding in caves fearing for his life and all, all the times in between. For you are with me. That's what makes all the difference for us. That the Lord is the closest companion ever, and he's with us. I think that's why David does what he does in this verse. I don't know if you've noticed it. What have we said about God up until this point? The Lord is, the Lord is, the Lord is. You know, he leads, right? He walks. He provides. What does David say in this verse? You are with me. All of a sudden, it's not just about God. It's to God. All of a sudden, things turn intimate. And I don't think that's an accident. I think that David was moved to, to make it personal, to make it a prayer, uh, when he realized at the very point of his greatest need, here's one who would not desert him ever. See, he knew about that because he'd been a shepherd and he'd had his sheep attacked by wolves and bears and stuff, right? And he must have known the temptation of the shepherd just to leave that one sheep and just go, right? But, but he knew that that's not what a good shepherd does. 
can you imagine him just almost being moved to tears by realizing that, that God would never leave him no matter what? Lord, you are with me. That was his assurance. That's a promise we have throughout Scripture. Paul in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul, he, he writes about a time that he was deserted by some people he thought were going to come through for him. He, he writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy 1.7. And, and, and he talks about all the people that he thought would come through that didn't come through. And here he is, he's alone, you know, and he's being held, and he's, he feels like he doesn't have a friend in the world, and he writes to Timothy. And, and you know what he says there? He says, yet the Lord stood by me and strengthened me. Yet the Lord stood by me and strengthened me. It's just what Jesus promised to do. Remember the Great Commission, Matthew 28? And, and we start at verse 18 usually, and and quote that, you know, the call to make disciples of all nations and teach them, and, you know. And, and Jesus gives us all that task. And then what does he say in verse 20? And I am with you to the very end of the age. Wonder why he said that? S some of the first followers of Jesus, they do what he told them to do, right? They'd go and they'd make disciples. They'd go far from their own land, some of them, and make disciples for Jesus and baptize them and teach them. And, and they, they'd be jailed for it and, and they'd be persecuted for it. And uh, many of the first followers of Jesus were crucified just like him for it. Peter upside down, we were told, you know, by tradition. And Jesus knew some of those valleys that they walked through, even in fulfilling what he asked them to do, what he commanded them to do. And he said, and I am with you to the very end of the age. And we don't know exactly what kept them going, but I'm thinking that's a big part of it, wouldn't you? That he left them with that promise, and he leaves us with that promise. I'm with you to the very end of the age. What a difference between I know God is with me and, and Lord, you really are with me. Have you experienced that? That's why sometimes some of the toughest trials for us end up being when we look back on them, the times that we felt most cared for by God and closest to God because he's promised he'll never desert us. So Isaiah fleshes that out a little bit. And I want you to just see these passages side by side because Isaiah 43 has been such an encouragement probably for many of you. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not fear evil, for you are with me. Isaiah 43 says, when you pass through the waters, same idea. Waters were chaos, unpredictability, things that could drown you, you know. When you walk through the waters, I will be with you, right? When you walk through the fire, has anyone ever walked through a fire? Good. I'm glad you're smart enough not to have walked through a fire. But, but you get the idea, right? That the things that could just consume you, destroy you. Sometimes our circumstances feel like that. You will not be burned. The flame will not consume you. It doesn't say you won't walk through the fire. But the idea is, I'll be with you. And then, and then Isaiah, actually, just before this, fleshes it out. He says, this is what the Lord says, who created you, O Jacob, who formed you, O Israel. Fear not, for I've redeemed you. I've called you by name in your mind. Four things there really quickly. He's created us. Can God see you through? He who spoke and made everything out of nothing? Sometimes we need to remember, you know, that, that we are here, that we live and breathe simply because of an act of, of his creativity. And that's the one who promises never to leave us, never to forsake us through whatever we go through. At least eight times, probably many more. <coughs> In the Old Testament, the Lord says, fear not, for I'm with you. In the New Testament, what is Jesus called? Emmanuel. What does it mean? God with us, right? And didn't he demonstrate that, that he was so much with us that he would... He would take his disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane and he'd, he'd pray, you know, agonizing over the cross he saw coming the next day. He would be with them. And he'd go to a cross for them. 
He's that much with you. The one who created you is with you. He says, I've, I've formed you. That's, that's the personal. That, that's the specific. I've formed you. That's the, I knew you before you were knit together in your mother's womb. I, I've seen all your days before one of them came to be. Saying, the, the one who's with us knows us inside and out, knows everything we face, knows us better than we know ourselves. And he's still shaping us. And even through some of the difficulties we endure, he will shape us. His hand is still on us. He says, I've redeemed you. Psalm 27, the Lord is my light and my salvation, right? He says, I've, I'm the one who's redeemed you. I've got a plan and a purpose for you. And finally, he says, I've, I've called you by name in your mind. In John 10, Jesus says, I give eternal life to them and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Being called by name is, is, is being known personally. We're his. It's an expression of God's personal care for each of us. He says, you're mine. And that's the one who's with us through the darkest valley. It's kind of like the little kid walking home from school through bully land <laughs> and fearing for his very life, right? Or hers. And the difference it makes to have a much bigger brother or sister walk with you and take your hand. <laughs> and that's what the Lord wants to do for us. He isn't aloof when we're suffering. He's right there with us. And he walks through it with us. However dark or difficult your valley is, I hope you're able to believe that today, that he is with you. You, might, you may not see where the Lord is in that, but he sees you, and he's right beside you. Most of my life has been uh, blessed, but there have been some valleys. I would dare say almost every one of us has experienced some pretty deep valleys. And I know for me, there, there, there have been a few so dark, thankfully long ago, when I wasn't sure I wanted to live through them. Or maybe even I prayed, God, can't I just die rather than, <laughs> rather than face this? But you know what? He saw me through. He's always seen me through. He's been with me, and I know he always will. Remember from week one, he's not the hired hand who takes the, to the trail when trouble comes. These are passages spoken from gut-wrenching circumstances, not pie in the sky. And David knew the difference that it made. That God was with him and would never leave him. As a pastor, I've seen that difference often when people face literal end of life, you know. That, that there's a peace that can't be explained, but that's not just end of life peace. I've seen it too in, in, in the way we face life situations, haven't you? I know just this week I saw somebody facing a life situation without that faith and saw the difference that it makes if, if we're able to see beyond ourselves and to know that we have a shepherd who walks through it with us. So be reminded of that and take hold of that. And if you haven't taken the shepherd's hand yet, you can do that today. He's always ready to start a new page with you. Will you take his hand? And trust him. We have this conviction. And I have this conviction personally. God, God, God has been better to me than I deserve. And the darkest chasms I go through are nothing that millions of others haven't experienced as well in this sin-broken world. 
And we don't have all the answers about that, but we do know this, that we've got a good shepherd who will never leave us. And he will one day right all wrongs and wipe away all tears. And one day, each of us will either die in faith or, or in our sin. But look at his commitments here. I created you. I formed you. I've redeemed you. I've called you by name. You're mine. I will be with you. In, in other words, what matters most is not specifically what happens to us, but who holds us. So let's turn to him in prayer. By the way, prayer requests, anyone? Nothing special this week? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, when dark trials come, and where perhaps any sign of earthly hope is so hard to see, help us then and help us in every circumstance to know, to trust, to believe that we have a good shepherd who walks with us through even the darkest valleys. And though we will fear, help us in the end to say, I'm not going to listen to that fear voice because I know that the Lord is with me. And Lord, where we need to, to, to experience that, for those of us that are struggling this morning, we pray that you would show us beyond a shadow of a doubt that you're committed to going the course with us. And may that give us hope and peace. We pray, Lord, in uh, troubled times, that you would answer all of the troubles that your people face. We pray that you'd hear our prayers. For those who, whose lives have been disrupted by natural disasters, for those who are exposed, some even this week, many even this week, to acts of violence and caught up in the throes of war. For those who are denied justice in this world. And for all who face illness that may never go away until the day you call them home. Lord, increase our faith. And help us to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that there is light at the end of that valley. That ultimately what you have planned for us is what you planned for creation all along before sin entered this world. The joy of knowing you. and a life and vitality that will go on forever in your presence. Thank you for the many blessings you pour out on us, Lord. Help us to be your agents in this world. Help us to do your good. Help us to share the blessing and the love we've experienced in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, we're going to do something as we receive our offering this morning. Next week, Julie's going to talk a little bit about Operation Christmas Child, and we're going to kind of kick in that shoebox thing uh, that we do this time of year. So there's a video we're going to watch as we give our gifts, and uh, I've seen it already, and uh, I, I think you're going to be moved and inspired by uh, this man down in Mexico uh, that we get a little glimpse of. Uh, in the next few minutes. So um, let's putting some things in a box and sending it off somewhere so we can feel good about ourselves. But 
about children and adults coming to Jesus. We have, um, that, so that's one opportunity coming up for ministry. Um, we, we have another opportunity for ministry, and that is through Love, Inc. Uh, locally here. And uh, Danita Carlson is uh, the executive director of Love, Inc., and she's here with us today uh, to share a few words with us. So um, we, we do have a video as well, and I guess it's when do you want us to see the video? Right now. Okay, so let's run the video, and then Danita will share with us. The first decade of the 2000s saw some massive changes for our area. Uh, first, we had the sale of Consolidated Papers and Rapids, uh, the largest employer in our region. Just a few years later, we saw the closing of the Port Edwards Mill uh, and the loss of all those jobs. And all of that uh, kind of worked together to bring some real challenges to our community. And that brought us to 2015, and there was uh, Danita Carlson had called me and I was working at uh, Christian Life Fellowship at the time and she'd call me to ask to get together and just have a conversation about what it would mean to uh, bring community transformation to our area. At that time I was working at the Wood County Health Department and was the coalition coordinator for the mental health and substance use coalitions. And what that means is I was bringing people together from all different sectors of the community. They were asking, where are the churches? Where are the faith community? And so the timing was just so perfect and it was definitely God's timing because the community was ready. And so we brought a group together, Paul and I, and what are some options for us? What are some different ideas? Let's look at different city transformation efforts within uh, not only our state, but in the United States. And at the time then we met a, a man who was on the board at Love Inc. in Sheboygan and uh, he had lunch with us and I just remember leaving that lunch and we, well all of us we kind of looked at each other and we said I think we found our model. A lot of times when we help people we actually hurt them, we enable them and redemptive compassion is more about relational compassion, it's more about the long walk with people to find out what's the story behind the need that they have. It's not about the bag of groceries or the gas card. There's something behind that. That's a, that's a hallmark of any Love Inc. and certainly ours. That We're interested in relational compassion. We're interested in getting to know people. We're interested in to introducing them back to the churches and the churches taking a long walk with people and helping them truly not only find the needs, the felt needs in their life, but have their life transformed by Christ. Love Inc. means love in the name of Christ. And what our mission is, is to mobilize local churches to transform lives and communities in the name of Christ. And what that really means is churches engaging their members to serve the community. And through that, lives will be transformed. And transformation takes time. And so this is not gonna happen Overnight, we're not gonna see transformed lives in a week or a month or maybe even a year. But we believe that lives will be transformed through relationships and those relationships are being built through the churches. Good morning, everyone. Is this on? All right. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. What did you think of that video? That is a brand new video that one of our partner churches put together for us, and we're super excited to start sharing that around the community. My name is Danita Carlson, and I am the executive director of Love in the Name of Christ of Southwood County. And as the video said, our mission is to mobilize churches to transform lives and communities in the name of Christ. And right now in Southwood County, we have 16 churches that are partnering with Love Inc. of Southwood County. And they are of nine different denominations. So this is a ministry in our community that is working across denominational lines, engaging their congregations to serve our community. 
As of August 28th, we celebrated one full year of operating in the Wisconsin Rapids area. We were super excited about that on September 16th and 17th. We had Loving National come and visit, visit our location go through a lot of um, different pieces, documents, uh, talk to our board, did, did interviews with volunteers and our board members, myself, and we are proud to announce that they have um, sent us the report and we are now a fully operational Love Inc. affiliate. And so what that means is, is we are part of a movement of over 130 ministries around the United States and in Kenya and a part of 30 other developing affiliates around the United States. So this is a movement across the United States that we are excited that you are a part of. We have many different needs that are coming into a call center at our location here in Wisconsin Rapids. And what we do is we, we have volunteers that come from our churches and they, we have a connection center that is open on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. And they take calls from people in need. And those calls range from anywhere from security deposits, gas cards, moving, car repair, lawn care, household items, cleaning, um, child care. I have a whole list here of 35 different needs that we've gotten within the last uh, year. And what we are looking for is volunteers within the church to help us with those needs. In the last year, I have some data here for, for you. In our first quarter, we had 49 calls for help. And this is the first quarter of 2019. And we were able to meet 43 of the needs that had come in. This last quarter, uh, which just finished up in, in September, we had 99 calls. So we doubled the calls that were coming into the Connection Center. And there were multiple, multiple needs that had come in and we were able to um, meet 103 needs. And when I say we, I mean you, the church. And so although our needs are, are doubling, our volunteer base is not. So we are looking for more volunteers to help serve those in our community who have needs. And we're also looking for donors to support the ministry. So if you're unsure where you could fit in, we do have um, monthly informational ses sessions at Love Inc. that are held the third Thursday of each month where you can learn more about Love Inc. We also have Discover workshops that are being held where you can come and learn what your gifts and talents are and how you can plug in to serve our community. And I have a table within uh, in your fellowship area and we have specific dates, um, cards on our table, sheets on our table where you can learn more about how you can plug in and be a part of this movement within the Wisconsin Rapids area. And thank you so much for all you have done already. We really enjoy partnering with churches around the community and your church has been very active and we are so thankful for you. And I look, I look forward to talking to you after church. Thank you, Danita. Really glad you could be here today and excited about being part of Love, Inc. Thanks. So check out the table and talk with Danita. And, uh, and if you, you know, have a question about Love, Inc., you think of later, uh, when she's gone, um, Donna DeWitt is on the board. So you just go to Donna any Sunday. <laughs> All right. Well, um, as we prepare to leave this place, um, we go out as Jesus ambassadors and uh, into a world with a lot of dark valleys. And sometimes we go through them, too. But we also go there to uh, to help others and to walk with others as he walks with us. And so may the Lord use you in that. Let's stand for the benediction and closing song, will you? Um, actually, the closing song and benediction. Let's, let's start by singing, Great is Thy Faithfulness, and then I have one more word to say after the song. So.
Great is thy faithfulness. 